Uh, I'm Brent Schroeder, the head of the Office of the CTO uh, with SUSE. And today I want to spend some time uh, discussing security in a cloud native environment. And as I spend time talking with customers regarding their cloud native transformation, security is absolutely the number one area of concern raised in every discussion. So much so that SUSE felt it critical to add a comprehensive solution for cloud native security to our SUSE Rancher container management platform. And thus we acquired New Vector, the leader in end-to-end -end cloud native security um, this past November, November. So let's dive in. As you are all likely experiencing in your organizations, more and more container environments are going into production. Not just sandboxes, but real environments where there's sensitive data to protect and there are PCI compliance and other types of compliance concerns that need to be uh, ensured covered. In a containerized Kubernetes cloud native environment, your traditional security tools that you're used to deploying, whether firewalls, IDS, IPS devices, malware scanning, any of these things don't typically work uh, in a cloud native environment, at least at the level of the business needs. And they're not gonna provide the visibility and protection you need. Specifically, Kubernetes has a layer of network abstraction that really makes it impossible for any type of traditional network security tool to see the network traffic. And to understand what is going why you need a solution that is designed specifically for a containerized Kubernetes cloud native architecture that you can put into your containerized environment. Now the container attack surface is not just hackers trying to get into a runtime environment, but rather the entire software pipeline or supply chain. And this is something that's really changed with DevOps and CICD and integrating from, from the very beginning uh, to automated pipelines all the way through the system to, to runtime. So full cloud native security really starts with the build and test phase where teams are building container images, perhaps bringing in open source as part of your applications. Critical vulnerabilities can enter at any of these phases and all the way through production, such as we saw with Log4j. And I'll use this as a case study later on. Vulnerabilities likely already exist in production and all of a sudden there's a discovery of a new critical vulnerability and you must find where it is running. So, that, so it's extremely critical that you can detect manage and remediate vulnerabilities end to end throughout the life cycle. Now, some of these new tools that are being used, whether it's Kubernetes or Rancher, or the registries that are being used in your pipeline can also be points of attack. Bad actors can try to inject unauthorized or tainted images into the pipeline. And that can be done by hacking in or just be a misconfiguration of this. Like we saw in the Tesla hack a couple of years ago, there was essentially an open Kubernetes cluster that allowed hackers to install crypto mining. And on top of that, we can't put security controls in place that are gonna break or slow the pipeline. What you're trying to do, and what every company out there is trying to do is to release new applications and update those as rapidly as possible. Sometimes hundreds or thousands of times a week or a month. And you can't require old security methodologies of say, you know, open a trouble ticket with uh, the IT organization. Say, I've got a new network connection required. I have to connect the firewall team to put in an application for a new port or a firewall hole to be opened. And it's gonna take days. And that just doesn't work when you want response times to be in, in hours or even minutes. I talked about the new attack surfaces, whether Kubernetes or Docker runtime had some vulnerabilities. And if you're considering layers on top of that, like a service mesh, such as Istio, those are also going to be target for attackers. And we've seen critical vulnerabilities discovered across this spectrum of Kubernetes, Docker, Istio, uh, all of the cloud native infrastructure. So this is really an additional headache for security experts to worry about. And finally, inadequate production in production. I consider that 
your more of your traditional attack surface. That could be an application layer, could be something you're exposing uh, an application, or it could be a modern API service that is being used and somehow getting attacked. Whether those are exploits of a vulnerability running in a container or zero day that have not been disclosed and there's no CVE available yet. Those things have to be monitored. You have to have visibility if there is an attack in progress. And if possible, you would ideally like to prevent or block it real time. So those things still exist, even if you're running in a containerized environment. So let's look at the, the whole life cycle here. We like to talk about a full life cycle security and also talk about layered security. So where you don't rely on just one security method, technique, or tool to provide your security for protecting critical processes and data. A layer of security method has multiple ways and chances of detecting an attack or an exploit in progress, which is why it is critical to have a layered security approach. We can roughly break this into two big buckets, supply chain security and runtime security. Supply chain is what I was referring to earlier in the discussion as around the pipeline. How do things happen in the pipeline? How do we prevent those from entering the pipeline? For those, we need vulnerability scanning and remediation during the pipeline process. We need compliance scanning, such as CIS benchmarks or other compliance auditing, looking for secrets embedded in images or containers, and then we need admission controls to prevent vulnerable or non-compliant deployments from even getting into the runtime environment. Once things are running in production environment, we need to scan those as well for vulnerabilities and compliance violations. As new vulnerabilities come up after deployment um, all the time. Threat-based controls are looking for typical ways hackers might abuse network connections, whether it's a DDoS attack, a WAF-based SQL injection attack or cross-site scripting attacks, ping death attacks, or other type of network-based ways uh, of either initiating attack or expanding the blast radius. <clears throat> Finally, something that you'll hear a lot from SUSE and from new vector team going forward is the notion of zero trust controls. This is a big shift that is happening in the security industry right now. We're moving from a more from more of an exception-based approach to a zero trust or declarative-based control. And I'll talk more about what zero trust is, what it means, and how you can deploy that. So let's look at the details and, and how this is implemented and in the, in the scope of protection. When we talk about full lifecycle container security, as I mentioned, you have to start very early in the developer run. We tend to break this into vulnerability and compliance management aspects, and then the runtime production aspects. It should start with building build level scanning. Whether, whatever build tools you're using, whether Jenkins, Circle C, Circle CI, Azure DevOps, or GitLab. At that point, where developers are building their container images, it should trigger a vulnerability and compliance scan. This ensures if there are any issues any vulnerabilities that are in those components or libraries, that build can be failed and rejected. The developers can then be forced to remediate those before they are sent down the pipeline. Then images are typically put into the registry. So we need to continually scan the registry for vulnerabilities, either because it may have passed your build pipeline or vulnerability has been discovered that wasn't known when the, when the image was originally stored in that registry. This is an area where we are continuously updating the CVE database that we use to detect these uh, vulnerabilities. And you'll see in some of the components, like the scanner component, that it is updated almost daily to incorporate new CVEs. CIS benchmarks and custom audits, essentially being able to run any type of benchmark, Kubernetes, your Docker daemon, or any of the containers that are running. Also, inspecting those for secrets, being able to uh, produce reports that help with PCI, 
GDPR, or NIST auditors. It's a whole new world in this cloud native environment. And PCI and other compliance auditing firms are still catching up with what it means to segment or to put in segmentation for credit card data. PCI in scope or not in scope data. What does it mean in a containerized environment? So there are a lot of education that needs to be done and these reports can be helpful for auditors. And finally, for your production environment, running Kubernetes in containers, being able to detect and remediate recently discovered vulnerabilities or even automatically quarantine a container if it has a critical vulnerability or the things you want to be able to do. Now, the way we tie this into the runtime environment is initially through admission controls. The mission controls are the, excuse me, the gatekeeper between the build and test pipeline environment into the runtime environment. So based upon scanning of the images, we can set up rules such as do not allow critical vulnerabilities that were discovered more, more than seven days ago. Because the developers have had a week to update their pipeline and remove those vulnerabilities. So we aren't going to allow any deployments into production that fail those criteria that you want to set up. So admission controls are that first critical uh, gatekeeper to the production environment. Now, once you are in production, this is where the traditional security controls as well as the new zero trust security controls need to be implemented. As these are implemented through a layer seven container firewall, that is specifically designed for Kubernetes in a containerized environment. This firewall can inspect all the network traffic, whether it is east-west, pod-to-pod, ingress or egress, to look for any of those types of segmentation violations or network tax that we'll look at in a minute. Then container workload security is really the way of inspecting and monitoring every running container, including containers or microservices to make up your application, as well as system containers to make sure no unauthorized processes or file activities are occurring within those containers. So again, with New Vector, we take a zero trust approach, which is to define an allow list of allowed behavior of your container. What are allowed network connections, east-west, as well as ingress and egress? And what are allowed processes and file activities in that container? Everything else is untrusted and can be blocked if set to that protect mode. Now, the big challenge for modern cloud native pipelines, as we talked about, is trying to deploy hundreds or thousands of new application updates, uh, new applications or updates in a week or a month. So how do we keep up uh, the configuration of this zero trust security model? How do we keep up with that rapid deployment pipeline? The ability to keep up with the speed of those deployments is, vi is via security policy as code and security automation. What is really needed, just like when you create your new microservices or applications, you create a YAML file that governs the deployment of that application, how many replicas and all the configuration of it. At the same time, there should be a security manifest that is declared for that service or application. That security manifest is really defining or declaring what behavior your container is going to be allowed to do in the production environment, what network connections it's going to make, what process and file activities are going to happen. And by managing security as code, checking it in, checking it out, updating it as part of your pipeline is the only way you can keep up with these modern automated pipelines. So that is the area that we focused on at New Vector to enable security automation integration into the environment and security policy as code. To recap some of the unique capabilities that are available for you to try out using the recently open sourced product. Um, and if you're familiar with New Vector, uh, you may know that it was initially a proprietary solution. Um, and as Ron mentioned, uh, SUSE is an open source company through and through. Uh, and so this past month, uh, we uh, released um, to GitHub uh, the open source um, of the product and we'll be soon making that available. Um, so going back to the, the unique capabilities, the automation of security policies that I've already talked about, 
um, the truly unique network visibility in production, being able to see that service mesh uh, network that's going from, from uh, uh, container to container within a pod. Um, you know, that's the ability, the ability to inspect every single connection, every single packet that is either going between your workloads or ingress, egress out of your cluster to make sure it doesn't violate any of your segmentation rules or contain embedded network attacks or enable stealing of sensitive data uh, through things like DNS tunneling or ICMP tunneling. And with that ability to do deep packet inspection comes the ability to do data loss prevention as well as implement a web application firewall or WAF. So that summarizes the core technology that New Vector developed for the cloud native environment and the capabilities delivered by New Vector that are really unique to the industry and allows you to provide that really cradle to grave uh, security of your cloud native environment. So let's look at, at uh, one of uh, an area that may be very familiar with, with many of you that are uh, have kind of. Uh, recently may have experienced uh, as a case study in layered defense or defense in depth, um, log4j. We like to call things, excuse me, we like to call things a kill chain because rarely is a massive security breach or hack a single security event. It is usually a kill chain of events. There's an ingress, there's an exploit, there's in this case, a remote code execution, perhaps a connection to command and control where then the malware, ransomware, or crypto mining software can be further downloaded and exploited, or can be moved straight to a data breach. So how do we try to protect against this and prevent this across the entire kill chain? So first let's talk about detection and remediation. When this vulnerability was first disclosed, Closed. Everyone scrambled, needed to scan all of the container images in their registry to see if this vulnerability existed in any of the images. Secondly, we needed to scan all the running containers to see if there was an immediate risk of exploit because it was actually in a running container or host. Once that is detected, then you can say, okay, I have to remediate that. In, if it's in the registry, I send it back through the pipeline, update the newest version, then deploy back to production uh, pipeline. Uh, and if you're running a highly automated, very responsive pipeline, that could be done the next day and, and either your registries can be updated and your running environment can be updated and you can now be back uh, you know, secure and safe. However, many more traditional enterprises you know, may take a week or, or even a month um, to get updated and, and back out into the runtime, uh, depending upon in the, uh, their specific environment. So if that's the case, <clears throat> the next big thing you need to look at uh, is prevention. If we can prevent this vulnerability from our images, um, that is great. You know, we can make sure that it doesn't get into our images in the first place. However, if, sometime an existing, if somehow an existing image was already in the registry and didn't get detected in time, um, such as, as you know, there were two or three follow-on vulnerabilities for log4j. So additional CVEs were issued uh, subsequently. Um, so you may have to run the scan for the first disclosure, but then follow-on ones are still in the image that may be in production. Uh, so the way we can manage that is by constructing different types of admission controls. So that if the CVE was detected, um, that that image could not be allowed to be deployed into the runtime environment. Or also make sure that it, if uh, it was based on a certain image version uh, or library or package version, those controls could also be put in place. However, the most important thing that really needs to be there uh, continuously is the runtime production. That is the ability to detect an actual exploit of log4j going on and to be able to alert on it or block it. If we consider what we can call day zero, this is before the CVE was even discovered and definitely before it was disclosed. The zero trust network protections govern the allowed behavior of your containers, potentially your hosts, the network connections and process and file activities. So that any attempt to try to exploit 
the log4j vulnerability would be de detected and could possibly be blocked even before it was recognized as a, as a vulnerability in a CVE initiated. Uh, and this is really the value of having these zero trust controls uh, properly in place. Now, one of the other things that was highly recommended for this vulnerability because there was egress connection that was part of the exploit are strict egress controls to be in place. Egress controls govern what external connections or clusters are allowed to make. These should be declared if it's in connecting to an external API server, if you're connecting to an outside IP address, uh, if you're connecting an outside IP address to an internal address where a database is running, all of these should be declared. Um, there should be very few instances where random internet access is allowed uh, outside of your container workload. So strict egress controls is another part of protecting against this vulnerability exploit. Then finally, day one plus, after the CDE was disclosed and documented, there are certain methods the attackers would use, uh, embedding it in web application requests, the URL, the header information. Um, quickly, we were able to come up with certain WAF rules that could be added to new vectorly fail safe. Uh, clever hackers uh, may be able to try to get around those WAF rules because they're regular expression based ingress WAF rules. Uh, but it is yet another layer. It could be done after the CDE is disclosed is automated quarantine. Um, if a container is discovered that is either uh, that with either uh, that container can be automatically quarantined. Um, now, obviously, if it's part of a critical business logic, um, it could impact part of the business that it's supporting. So those types of, of controls need to be carefully considered. Um, hey, Brent? And finally, we already talked about putting in place admission control rules. Yes. Good. Yeah, if you could summarize, and I think there might be a little bit of bandwidth issues on your end. So maybe for your concluding comments, if you could maybe turn off your camera, because I want to make sure we get your call to actions very clearly. Absolutely. Um, and I noticed a pop up twice in the presentation that had mentioned uh, network bandwidth. So you're right on point here. We're at the end. So the key thoughts and takeaways here uh, for cloud native security um, it cannot be an afterthought, and you shouldn't think about it as after I get the application developed, then how do I secure it? Um, it needs to be uh, built in um, as the applications are being developed. And do not assume that it's built into the cloud. Um, it's really part of the application development process, and it must be automated. And to truly get full cloud native security, you want to take full advantage and enforce uh, zero trust uh, methodologies. So with that, I thank you very much for the time today and uh, you know, get in touch with us at SUSE and we'd be glad to dive in in more details in, in how we accomplish uh, cloud native security in your environment. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. Thank, I'll turn thank it back you over so to much, you. Brett.